In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So my sabbatical has had many benefits, uh, but one uh, issue with my sabbatical is that for the second week in a row, I've woken up in the middle of the night on Saturday incredibly anxious that I'll get up with nothing to say. So uh, its text is uh, hoping this doesn't become a fulfilling prophecy. Um, it's like being a new preacher all over again. So, uh, it hardly makes sense uh, to us, but if you ask historians and scholars what led to Jesus being nailed on a cross, many would say that it had as much to do uh, with what he said and what he did around the dining table as anything else. As much as his miracles, his proclamation that he was the Son of God, his proclamation that he had the power to forgive sins, even raising the dead back to life, or his uh, insinuation that there was something more mighty than even the Roman Empire uh, and a deity greater than Caesar, even more than that, what got him nailed to the cross was what he said and did around the dining room table. It doesn't make sense, does it? See, at the table, that was where culture and religion met at the same place, and both were shaken by the words and actions of Jesus. So religiously, the table represented the place where you were pure, the place where you were careful about what came into your mouth, where your food came from, what food you ate, the place uh, where you put a circle around yourselves and made sure you only dined with people that you trusted uh, were as clean and as holy and pure as you. And that's how you honored God, by making sure you were pure. And if a person was a sinner or a cripple or hurting in any way, you wouldn't invite them. Because you told yourself they're only hurting or crippled or lame or blind uh, or widowed or in some personal crisis because of some notorious sin uh, so that I can keep my circle around my table. And who knows where their food came from? If they sinned about that, why wouldn't they sin about something else? Why would they follow all the laws that we're called to follow? So the table was clean. Culturally, the table was the place where you invited the folks uh, that could do something for you, that could help you raise your status uh, in a place uh, where there isn't a whole lot of mobility uh, and you feel like uh, any inch you can get above the next person uh, is, is an inch you're willing to jump for. Uh, the table becomes critically important. And who invites you to dinner and who you invite to dinner are critically important. You invite people to dinner that can raise your status. Uh, people who uh, it would benefit you to be in their circles. Uh, and uh, when you go to dinner of somebody who might be able to help you, uh, you want to be as close to them as possible. And there is no humility uh, in this culture. Uh, in a shame culture, uh, uh, you led with your pride. And you went straight to the top seat. And I can only imagine Jesus watching this whole thing uh, unwind. And I can imagine him being kind of twofold. Part of him sort of with a, a grin, uh, kind of laughing at the spectacle that everybody was making of, of trying to jimmy, shimmy themselves up to that front seat, elbowing other people out of the way, uh, feeling like so much of their value, of their worth, hinged on which seat they got at a table. And you realize they're, they're, they're sitting on the ground, and so uh, I mean, it's not even really the same kind of thing that we're thinking about. Why does it matter? And I think Jesus just shaking his head and says, my beloved children are asserting themselves and how much they matter by where they're uh, lying around this table. And then the other emotion was probably sadness. I've worked so hard to show these people that they are beloved children of God. Their identity as sons and daughters of God are why they matter. They matter because they were made and loved by a God whose nature is love. They don't matter because of where they sit at this dinner table or at the next dinner table or who invites them back. 
And I can see why Jesus wanted to break both of these table traditions right in the middle. But I can also see why it shook and rattled people to their core. If staying clean doesn't matter, if upward mobility doesn't matter, then how do I measure myself? How do I know if I matter? How do I know if I matter up and against him or her? You know, we went on our trip cross country and I've talked about a lot of my favorite things. Um, my daughter's not here, so I'll talk about one of my least favorite things. And that was uh, the thing that she wanted to do most, uh, to go to Hollywood and Beverly Hills and uh, all of this stuff there. And my blood pressure must have gone up. Uh, you know, and, uh, and granted, we were there to see conspicuous consumption. I mean, that's kind of what she wanted. She wanted to see uh, where Jay-Z and Beyonce lived and where Justin Timberlake lived. Uh, but as you're there and you see this kind of incredible, uh, incredible wealth uh, and how it's shown, uh, the kind of cars you don't see around here, Maseratis and Lamborghinis and Ferraris right and left and houses with uh, a bedroom that's 7,500 square feet, a 7,500 square foot bedroom. Uh, and, you, uh, and you find out that, you know, it's not just uh, uh, cool to go to the trendy, uh, a trendy coffee shop, but you have to go to the right one. Uh, and you usually come from the right yoga studio or whatever the uh, most re recent fitness craze is. Uh, and again, we're there to see uh, this kind of con uh, conspicuous consumption. And um, uh, it was difficult uh, as somebody who was in a pair of uh, $10 flip flops, uh, tattered 12 year old shorts that my wife doesn't like me to wear, uh, a t-shirt that probably had a hole in it. Uh, I'm not the tallest or most bronze. Uh, my hairline uh, you know, isn't the most impressive. And I'm driving a, a, a pack to the gills minivan that has more bugs on the front dash. And I am thinking to myself, how much do I matter here? What do they see when they look over at me? And then I started to think. As we went down Rodeo Drive and saw all of these, this clothing that I, I, I my whole wardrobe uh, doesn't cost uh, as much as some of the things in the windows. Uh, and I thought about all the things that people assert give them value. But what does that mean to the person on the other side of the interstate in Los Angeles who lives uh, in a community that you wouldn't expect to see in the United States or any developed country? If person A has value because they have a 7,500 square foot bedroom, if they have value because they drive a Lamborghini, uh, because they have uh, a four-figure t-shirt, how much does person B, who lives in squalor, who's lucky to have a shelter overhead, how much do they matter to that person? It changes things. The yardstick you set for yourself whether you mean to or not, conveys what you think of the other. So Jesus, in this first part, starts to just gently fiddle a little bit, maybe a little bit of meddling. He says to them, just an idea. Maybe you don't sit right at the prime seat, but maybe just a few back. Maybe you just start down at the other end and... Um, just because wouldn't it be a lot cooler if they came and told you, uh, buddy, come on, Ben, I, I want you to sit up here than it is for them to not tap me on the shoulder and say, Ben, uh, you're in Bob's seat. Can you uh, slide down a little bit? But really, he's trying to shift them a little bit out of this way of thinking. And then he goes from just gently nudging and meddling and trying to shift them uh, to pretty much knocking them upside down. He says, you know, better yet, why don't you think totally differently about the dinner parties you have? Why don't you think totally differently about the people you engage? Why don't you think less about what they can do for you, how they can build up uh, your reputation, your status, and why don't you invite people who are indeed hungry, who won't judge the food on your table, but will lap it up because they haven't gotten a meal that day? What if you started to value different things about yourself instead of where you sat at this table, 
Because then you might respond to the other a little differently. If you saw yourself as having value, not because of where you sat at the table, not because of what you owned or what you drove uh, or where you went to hot yoga that day, uh, but because you were a beloved child of God, because God made you wonderfully, how might your dinner party look a little bit differently? Jesus doles out a little advice and he's meddling a little bit. And most likely in that pride culture, it fell on deaf ears. But when he starts to tilt the table, you start to realize that this isn't just about a dining room table. This is about a God who came to turn things upside down, to say anyone who finds themselves outside these doors, not invited to the dinner party, not at the prime seat, know this. You are my beloved child. And everything that God has said and done affirms that. You're not pure and worthy because you've never screwed up or because you followed every dietary law or because uh, you were rewarded with amazing wealth. You have value because I made you and I love you and I will never stop loving you. And when you trust that, which is what we're claiming today in baptism, when will you trust that spirit of adoption that you were made out of love, that that love washes over you? Then you're charged. You're charged to go out into the world and respect the dignity of every human being. You're charged to go and see that in other people, to change your yardsticks. So Jesus invites us to think about the first. And it certainly was easy uh, in Rodeo Drive and Beverly Hills for me to pass judgment on how people value themselves, uh, what they establish and assert uh, makes them special, um, especially from my uh, uh, worn down minivan. Uh, but when I get home, I have to start asking myself that question in my own life. What's harder to see? Where do I set up value for Ben Moss uh, where it's not where God puts value? And when I address that, when am I more capable, more open to see that beauty in someone else? Jesus invites us to the first before tipping the dining room table a little further. How do we make our dinner table look like God's banquet? We're inviting a beloved child of God to God's banquet. How are we going to make sure when we make those vows, when we make those promises, that we affirm them, that we clean our own hearts so that we can be filled for the care of others, so that we can make other people feel as beloved and important as that person right beside God at the dinner table. Amen.